Right. Hello, uh, my name's Steve Jabo, you just heard, and you'll just heard also that uh, I'll be talking about the aptitude for fossils as materials, and number eight, the understanding and aptitude in the use of preparation tools and techniques. Yeah, those two. So the aptitude for fossils as materials, uh, it says a competent, a competent preparation requires an intrinsic sensitivity and feel for fossils as physical, often fragile material. <clears throat> the preparator combines this innate aptitude with an understanding of the scientific value of fossils and a lack of competency in this area cannot be offset by knowledge of preparation and conservation theory. So what does that all mean? The uh, short answer is don't be a klutz. <laughs> so moving, uh, have gentle hands. Um, moving on to number eight, the understanding and aptitude in the use of preparation tools and techniques. The qualified preparator can select the most appropriate tools and techniques to skillfully reveal scientific information and safeguard the long-term well-being of the specimen. The preparator should be proficient in the preparation of common modes of, of vertebrate fossil pr preservation and in challenging situations should be able to seek further guidance in the preparation and conservation literature. The preparator augments this knowledge through professional conferences and communications with colleagues. And what does that mean? That all boils down to know how to use the right tool and use your tools well. So to recap, don't be a klutz, you know how to use the right tool and you're either born with it or you're not. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, <laughs> actually, I had, a, I had a hard time coming up with uh, 20 minutes worth of material to talk about these, uh, especially number two, the aptitude for fossils and materials. It's a little more in, uh, theoretical than the other ones. Um, but we know that uh, all of the, uh, the competencies are related, and number two is absolutely related to number eight, um, how to use the proper tools. But number, number two, uh, the aptitude for fossils as materials competency is related pretty much to all the other competencies. They involve either handling the fossil while collecting it, preparing it, conserving and housing it, and studying it. Um, it means you understand that fossils are the physical and often fragile material. Uh, they involve the long-term storage health of the fossil and its continued usefulness to science, um, understanding the scientific value of fossils. <clears throat> uh, this competency also is related to health and safety because you need to be aware of uh, potential hazards um, from collecting it uh, or the materials um, used in its prior uh, treatments or its actual chemical composition. Things to know while you're handling it and prepping it. And most of those topics fall to the preparator's purview. No pressure. So let's take a look at number two, a little closer look. We'll go for the long answer this time. It says a good preparator has an intrinsic sensitivity and feel um, for fossils as physical, often fragile material and this innate aptitude is combined with an understanding of the scientific value of fossils. So really translated, that means that you have a natural, uh, naturally understand that fossils are not just rocks or lumber uh, that you hammer and glue and bolt together. Um, you understand that fossils are often fragile, uh, broken and unstable assemblages of altered hydroxyapatite, um, dirt and rock matrix, mineral deposits, sometimes sage roots, um, and that all, they all react differently uh, uh, in different conditions. And you understand that each fossil is unique and potentially important to scientific research, and that each one is one more piece of the puzzle. So you have to start with a respect for fossils and what they represent, and your hands follow. Uh, this competency also states um, <clears throat> A lack of competency in this area cannot be offset by knowledge of preparation and conservation theory. That's pretty intimidating. Um, you do have to have an innate aptitude. I get a 
make sure I don't say ineptitude. <laughs> Innate aptitude. Um, a certain level of hand-eye coordination is necessary to do the job correctly, uh, like anything that you use your hands for. Uh, but we don't expect you to be the next Michelangelo. Um, that said, innate aptitude will only get you so far. Um, you have to continually train and learn and hone your skills. Um, it's absolutely necessary to do that. Uh, you have to want to continue uh, learning about preparation and conservation throughout your, your career. Um, continue better getting, uh, getting better and more knowledgeable about the subject, what you might call experience. Um, experience isn't just how long you've been doing something, um, but it's the learning and refining of your skills as you're doing something. Um, we should learn by our experiences. Our experiences, both good and bad, uh, they're all lessons. And experience matters. So fossil pre preparation has a pretty steep learning curve. Um, you have to very quickly learn literally how to pick a fossil up and put it down again. It's probably the first thing you have to learn. Um, you have to figure out pretty quickly whether or not you have an aptitude for fossil preparation. Uh, you learn pretty quickly if experience is going to help you hone your skills uh, and refine your natural skills. I remember when I first started working in the lab, I was pretty surprised at how seemingly robust bone, how fragile and breakable that stuff is. And uh, once I learned that, though, it changed the way I handled things. I knew how to handle it. It changed my mindset. Um, and in a short time, I learned more and more. I learned uh, where different bone elements are most fragile, um, noting where they're always broken and repaired. I began to see uh, structural flaws like micro fractures across the surface that, that would tell you a zone of weakness on that fossil. Um, I learned what to expect a fossil's preservation uh, to be like um, based on the matrix and the formation it was from and on and on. And today all that informs my, my uh, preparation methodology and how I handle fossils. My first experiences uh, with fossils let me discover whether innate, whatever innate skill I might have had and my continued training and refining in this field or my experience definitely improved it. Uh, more importantly, it molded my thinking. What kind of thinking? Yes, my critical thinking. <laughs> Critical thinking is everywhere. So the aptitude for fossils is materials, uh, as Greg pointed out, this competency, um, much of this stuff is more uh, about your mind as it is your skills, uh, maybe more so. Um, it's the critical thinking is the common thread that's woven throughout the preparation competencies and what sews the whole tapestry together. Um, we've already talked about this a lot. You've already seen that. You don't have to read the whole thing again. <clears throat> But the pertinent section of the competency is this, and the pertinent section of that pertinent section is this. <laughs> just boil it down. The preparator must be able to monitor the immediate physical impacts upon the specimen by handling, and has the ability to conceptualize, think creatively, and evaluate information in a systematic, purposeful, and efficient manner. <clears throat> so you have to be able to take in information and process it. Um, you have to be able to learn from your experiences and others' experiences from your mistakes and from others' mistakes. Um, we then have to have the ability to process information to inform us how we handle a fossil and how we expect it to react under different circumstances and scenarios. But what if you wanted to work on fossils but you had never handled a fossil before? How do you know if you have this innate aptitude? Uh, Matt mentioned our, our paleo training program for our, our uh, volunteer fossil lab. When we were um, putting that together, uh, our fossil lab manager, Abby Telfer, came up with an enlightening application process that included a description of the work as well as a questionnaire. <clears throat> and Rollies had to fill this questionnaire out uh, to see if they might have the mind and skill sets um, to work in the prep lab. And this is for their sake as well as ours. Let me start off with a basic question, if they ever had any fossil handling experience. Then it moved into the requirements of the lab. Um, good thing to know, uh, 
uh, demands about the job that you might not think about besides coordination and um, manual dexterity. Um, it gave the enrollee insight into what sort of personality is best suited for preparation, patient and cautious, slow to frustrate, or at least able to cope with frustration. Um, were they the type of person who can take direction? Or were, do they always know everything about everything they were doing? Hint, you need to be able to take direction. Nobody knows everything about fossil prep when you first start. Nobody knows anything about fossil prep even 25 years later for me. Um, could they see well? You have to be able to see what you're doing. And the conditions in the lab, um, were they restricted physically? Were they squirmy, always moving around? Or could they sit still or stand for long periods of time? And the rest of the application was sort of a, a very polite inquisition on their, their skills. Um, what do you like to do? Tell us about yourself. We wanted to know um, if they were good to their hands. Can they make things? Can they use tools? Uh, the answers to these questions gave us a baseline to start evaluating if we thought they might be capable of working in the lab. And then we continue to explore a little bit deeper into their personalities. What do you like to do? We want to know, do they have any activities or uh, hobbies that might directly translate to preparation? The list of activities reflected the need for an agile and clever mind, uh, the need for memory and dexterity, were they physically active, and so on. Um, lots of good info. And the whole thing kind of acted as a self-assessment tool that enabled them to determine, self-determine, whether or not they thought they'd be a fit for the lab. Some people never finished the application, um, which is a good thing for them and for us. <laughs> but, and, but very few people who did, who took the training, filled out the application, um, decided that it just wasn't their bag. Um, these are the types of things that you need to ask yourself to determine if you have an aptitude for fossil prep. And so to summarize, uh, the aptitude for fossils as materials. Um, don't be eclipsed, again. <laughs> All right, so let's go, let's look at number eight, the Ocho. Understanding the aptitude um, in the use of preparation tools and techniques. Uh, this one's a little more straightforward um, about the mechanics of preparation, a little less theoretical than, than number two. Um, and I read this before. Uh, but we'll break it into chunks and make it a little more manageable. <clears throat> the qualified preparator can select the most appropriate tools and techniques to skillfully reveal scientific information and safeguard the long-term well-being of the specimen. The preparator should be proficient in the preparation of common modes of vertebrate fossil pre preservation. So these were made for vertebrates, obviously. Um, so you, you learn uh, in your lab certain tools work better on certain matrices. Um, should I use an air scribe for this? Should I use a grinder? Do I need to use acid prep on this? Should I use a microscope? All that stuff uh, you learn, so you need practice with your tools on scraps of matrix, um, different matrices before you start working near the specimen or on the specimen. Um, you improve your technique. You learn to use the right tool at the right time and use it skillfully. And the same with techniques. Um, you train doing things, you practice doing them, and pretty soon you learn how to make a, the safest way to make a mold of something, um, for an example. And so on. And always document, as we are learning too. Document everything you do. Uh, this part's important. Know your limits. In challenging situations, a preparator should be able to seek further guidance in the preparation and conservation literature. We all do it. We've all been working on something and something pops up that has never come across us before. We don't know what to do. We don't have a plan. So we, we ask people what to do. Um, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of current preparation literature right now. We're working on it. Um, so most of the time, we reach out to our, our uh, prep community for help. Um, the preparator augments this knowledge through professional conferences. Here we are. <laughs> I came here to get augmented. 
I don't know about you guys. And we augment our knowledge through communication with colleagues. Um, generally, we start with our immediate coworkers in the lab. Um, we used to do, you know, you had a very small circle of people you could work with, ask questions about. <clears throat> you always went to the, the gray beards. Um, <laughs> kind of ironic. Uh, and your associates, but, and, uh, but now we have the prep list, which is, uh, is the vertebrate paleontology preparator, preparator's mailing list. Uh, it's a tremendous resource uh, in seeking guidance from your fellow preparators. Um, I rec recommend joining it if you haven't joined it yet. It's, uh, it's a friendly, very um, helpful group. Um, the instructions are on that link there at the bottom. Let's see if I can, oh, wrong one, right there. Um, it's also the, the uh, instructions to join it are also on the SVP website in the preparator's resource section under four members. Um, so to summarize the, un the understanding and aptitude of use of preparation tools and techniques, know how to use the right tool and use it well, so we're full circle. Um, uh, this is gonna be, um, I'm actually pretty short on time, uh, long on time. Um, but before I go, I wanted to say you might not ever have the opportunity to be proficient in every single one of these competencies. There are some that you have to be, critical thinking, health and safety, um, knowing um, adhesives and things like that, but some things you just won't be asked to do. You have to be proficient in everything that you're required to do, though. And you should strive uh, to keep learning and honing your skills in, in anything that you're asked to do uh, throughout your career. Um, thank you. I'd like to acknowledge uh, AMP for organizing this, uh, especially Connie and, and Matt for getting us together. Uh, Smithsonian for everything they do for me, including funding me to come here. And all the people I've learned from over the years and uh, all the people who give me opportunities to develop my skills. So, get augmented. Thank you.